Um, I get the great honor of introducing our guests. Oh, by the way, I'm Jennifer Gillies from Accessibility Services, and it's really exciting for me to be here too with you all. And David um, Lepowski, who is our, our guest speaker today, is a lifelong disability rights advocate, lawyer, and chair of the Grassroots Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Alliance, and the former co-chair of the Barrier Free Canada group as well. And from 1994 to 2005, David led the fight to win the enactment of the Accessibilities for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. <laughs> And in the early 1980s, took an active part in the successful campaign to get disability equ equality included in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the Ontario Human Rights Code. And we also have with us today, too, Thea Curdy, who worked for the last 16 years as a Code and Universal Design Specialist at Canada's leading accessibility consulting firm, Design Able Environments. And Thea provides drawing reviews for architecture firms and completes building audits and is also a contributing author and illustrator sorry, for creating accessibility standards for every level of government and corporations. Well, without further ado, let's please welcome our guests and enjoy the great talk today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to kind of do a tag team. We're tight on time, so we're going to get right to work. Step number one, take out your smartphones. Why? I encourage you to live tweet this event using the hashtag AODA, and I encourage you to follow us at AODA Alliance. We're not shy. We want you to be part of the campaign for full accessibility. You're going to get two perspectives on the same question, me from the perspective of disability rights, community organizing, and advocacy, and Thea from the point of view of a design professional working on accessibility, but our message is the same. We need to design a world for the first time that includes everyone. We live in a world that is designed right now on a ridiculous basis. The buildings we go into and try to use, the stores where we want to shop, the goods we want to buy, the schools and colleges and universities we want to learn in, the public transit facilities we want to ride, everything has been historically designed on the unfair proposition or premise, never written out, never thought about in advance, but that they're only there for people who have no disability, no physical disability, no sensory disability, no mental, intellectual, learning, or mental health disability, or cognitive disability. Now that way of designing a world is ridiculous. It's ridiculous because there's so many of us. In Ontario, 1.8 million people now have a disability. Across Canada, that's 4 million people. Around the world, that's 1 billion people. Now those numbers are ginormous, but they're just a small part of the picture. Because you see, everybody either has a disability now or gets one later. You just got to get older, and it's only natural that you're going to acquire a disability. We are the minority of everyone. So to design a building or public transit or school system or curriculum or anything else as if people with disabilities weren't full and equal participants is ultimately self-defeating. It's to ultimately hurt every last one of us. We are both ecstatic to have a chance to speak to you. This is the first time I've talked to architect students in the 22 years I've done this advocacy. I'd like this to be the start of a new voyage. And our message to you is a simple one. I want you to change the profession you're about to go into. I want you to transform design professions like architecture so that they are first and foremost all about designing buildings for everyone. And if a building isn't for everyone, it should not be built. It's as simple as that. Now, to get that message across, let me share a couple of quick ideas and then we're going to get to concrete examples. The first thing I want you to understand, when this idea I start with, designing a world for everyone, it's not the way we've done business. For example, forget buildings. Let's talk about computers and software. The old way they were designed was as if you had two working hands, two working eyes, ears, and so on. You could use a keyboard and a mouse. You can read the screen. And if you couldn't use it, 
then what you had to do, and as a blind person I know this only too well, is to go buy adaptive technology, very expensive, to retrofit your computer to enable you to use it. That's the old way. Design with barriers, let them clean up the mess for themselves later at great expense. It's not a good way to work. The new way to work is called universal design. Build accessibility into everything. Now, I'm not a salesperson for the Apple Corporation, but probably the best corporate leader on accessible universal design is Apple. I have an iPhone on my hip. It comes fully equipped with a screen reader for blind people, with a large screen for low vision people, adaptations for people with hearing loss. They're all built in. You just go to settings, general, and accessibility, and they keep adding new features. It doesn't cost an extra dime to have those features on board. That's the wave of the future. I want to encourage you as future architects to commit yourselves now that any building you design will be built on principles of universal design or you won't design it. And I want to further encourage you to demand of those who teach you here that they teach you how to do that. And so that you could become the first generation in your profession. Usually you join a profession. When I became a lawyer uh, yeah, a few years ago, uh, <laughs> I didn't know anything. I was the new kid on the block. Everybody was practicing for years. They knew more than me. I want to turn it around in your profession. I want you to be the ones who are there to teach. I want you to be the ones when you hit the ground in your first jobs to be teaching those you're working for how to do it right. You know, it's commonly thought out there that old buildings are full of accessibility barriers because we just didn't know better or perhaps because we hadn't yet invented people, you know, with disabilities back 5, 10, 20 years ago, right? But it's commonly thought that new buildings, we get it right. We're going to give you examples shortly of how we keep getting it wrong. That that supposition is just not true. And it's not true for a couple of reasons. I'm going to give them right up front, and then we're going to dig right into examples and offer you what you can do about it. First, we get it wrong because the law is inadequate. The Ontario Building Code is out of date even when it was updated. Before it was updated in 2013, it was a 19th century building code. They updated it in 2013 to go into effect for 2015 from an accessibility perspective to bring it into the, oh, let's just say early to mid 20th century. But it's still way out of date, and I can tell you having lobbied to get it strengthened, we ran into incredible resistance. And the result are buildings built to code that are not accessible. And that hurts the minority of everyone. That's the first problem. The same with accessibility regulations under the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. Proud to have led the fight for this legislation, but what little they provide about the built environment is still woefully inadequate. The third problem, the third problem is that design professionals almost overwhelmingly, or at least too often, don't realize that those are not the only two laws they have to obey. There's another law they have to obey. It supersedes those laws. It's the Ontario Human Rights Code, and in the case of government buildings, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. They guarantee to people with disabilities to equality without discrimination. To design a new public building for use in the public sector is to fly in the face of the guarantee of equality in the Charter of Rights and the Human Rights Code, and in the private sector, it's to fly in the face of the requirements of the Ontario Human Rights Code. Just building the code and to AODA standards is not fulfilling an organization's obligations in the law. So if you ever hear people talk about, well, let's go above code, because that'll be doing extra. Nope, it's not doing extra. It's only doing extra if it's also meeting the full requirements of full inclusion in the Charter for the Public Sector and the Human Rights Code for all sectors. Now, I told you we were going to jump into this uh, with some examples. Before I do, I want to get you involved. If you'd like to learn more about this, or indeed to join our campaign for accessibility, we want you with us. Jen is going to pass around a list. 
Please print your email address or ask for assistance if you need it and print your name. We'll sign you up for AODA Alliance emails and if anybody's watching a video of this, just send a request to aodafeedback at gmail.com. That's aodafeedback at gmail.com. And all you gotta say is sign me up. We'll add you to our email list. You'll learn how to get involved. We welcome your feedback. We welcome your inclusion. We welcome your participation. Now, on to practical examples. We're all about them. I'm going to give you one verbally. Thea is going to do a PowerPoint presentation, and then we're going to show you a video to give you a stunning example. And as you see these, just think in your own work, do I ever want to be associated with designing one of these? First example I'm going to give you, but I can describe it to you. The brand new re renovations at the Osgood Hall Law School, where I am a part-time visiting professor. I went to Osgood 40 years ago. I learned my way around as a totally blind person in about an hour or two. It was not great for wheelchair access, but for a blind person, I bombed around that building independently with no problem. 35 or some odd years later, major architecture firm brought in, major renovation. It's gorgeous. They improved wheelchair access. It's become one of the worst buildings I've ever tried to navigate. It's horrible. As just one example, Blind people use a white cane in a major public space to find our way, it's called wayfinding, by shorelining following a wall. There's a major thoroughfare on the main floor of Osgood. On one side, soft seating every couple of meters. So the only way I can shoreline it is by slaloming around and whacking students in the shins. <laughs> Not so good. The opposite wall would be perfect. It's a nice straight wall, but every couple of meters, there's a pillar. There's not only a pillar, there's an angled pillar. So my cane goes under it, my head whacks into it. That hurts me and sighted people who are texting while walking. I'm <laughs> sure you've never done that. Just one of many design blunders that has made an accessible building for me into a substantially less accessible or inaccessible building. That's example one. You don't want to be involved in that. You want to do the opposite. I'm going to turn it over to Thea to give you some other examples. Thanks very much, David, and thanks very much to everybody for coming. It's terrific to be here with you. Slide one. What is accessible design? The picture shows a red question mark in the center of the image with lots of blue arrows all pointing to the center question mark. I thought I'd talk a little bit about my role as an accessibility consultant, and in my personal view, I see this as a role of listening. I get to work with architects, so I listen to architects. I get to work with building owners, so I get to work with facilities management people and owners' perspectives on accessibility. I get to work with policymakers, every level of government, so I get to hear what they're thinking about for accessibility, the complaints that they're hearing. But the most important are people with disabilities. There's a common phrase out there, nothing about us without us. You shouldn't be designing something for people with disabilities if you haven't talked to people with disabilities. And somebody like David, an advocate for people with disabilities, and an invaluable resource for me to help the designers create better spaces. Minimum compliance for OBC and AODA. Here we see a fictitious site plan of a community center. We see the building at the top of the image in the center and parking lots on both left and right sides at the bottom. There are numbered boxes highlighted in red numbering 1, 2, 3, and 4. There's a corresponding legend, also shown in red, listed at the bottom left of the screen. The number one represents the playground, number two, the accessible parking, number three, the drop-off area near the front entrance, and number four, the curb ramps. I wanted to start with just a quick example of what David's talking about. Here's a sample made up site plan showing what would be required for this building to be OBC and AODA compliant. OBC is Ontario Building Code for anybody watching. The Ontario Building Code and the AODA obviously don't have very much required of us here. Ontario Human Rights Solutions. Again, we see the same site plan we just saw in the previous slide. This time we see there have been a number of changes and improvements made to the design. And there are a lot more red indicator boxes with a lot more numbers. In fact, the numbers now number 1 through 11. 
So in addition to the previous requirements that were highlighted, the playground, the drop-off, the parking, and the curb cuts, the parking has been moved, the drop-off area has been adjusted, the curb ramps in every location where people would be crossing where the cars are all have a painted crosswalk and have been aligned with the path of travel. A legend, the bottom to middle of the screen this time, item number one, tactile walking surface indicator, also known as a TWSI. Number two, tactile map. Number three, rest areas. Number four, a playground. Number five, the curb cut. Number six, the crosswalks. Number seven, public parking. Number eight, staff parking. Number nine, drop curb with a tactile attention indicator. Number 10, a dog relief area. And number 11, designated snow piling area. But look what actual accessibility would require. So if you were trying to achieve the, what the Ontario Human Rights Code is asking for, I think you'll agree if I go back and forward, that's much more comprehensive. Think about people with disabilities as people first, not as an afterthought. Minimum Compliance OBC AODA. This slide shows the same made up community centre building. We see a basic floor plan of the first floor. This time, the red number indicator boxes number six elements. Item number one indicates where the power door operators are required by code. Number two, where the service counter would be located. Number three, that there is a reflecting pool. Number four, our exit stairs that have the appropriate tactile attention indicator at the top. Number five, a universal washroom. And number six, an elevator. The next example I wanted to show you was an example of a floor plan. Again, what does the Ontario Building Code and the AODA require of you? And yet, what would we actually need to be doing? And this actually isn't even a full slide. If I'd really filled it up, you probably couldn't have seen the floor plans. Ontario Human Rights Solutions. Again, we have the same building with the same floor plan. An enormous change in the number of requirements. A legend that appears from the lower left to the center of the screen, one through nine. Item number one, tactile walking surface indicator, also known as directional wayfinding. Number two, the service counter. Number three, the reflecting pool, which now has a detectable edge. Number four, the tactile attention indicator at the feature stairs. Number five, the feature stair. Number six, the universal washroom, several locations. Number seven, the elevator. Number eight, the accessible washrooms, several throughout the building. And number nine, the power door operator. So an entirely different approach to design. I want you to think about what's happening with green design. How do you design a green building? You don't design a regular building and put the green stuff on in the end. That's an inefficient way to use and maximize what green design is for. You actually put the green design elements at the beginning of the design process, and then what happens is the end result is amazing, and it maximizes every possible outcome for that green design. The same is true for accessibility. If you start at the beginning thinking people with disabilities are people first, and their space requirements or other accommodations are just a part of the requirements, you start and you continue and make a dramatically different building. Changing abilities over a lifetime. The image shows a woman's lifespan using the international icons. The left side starts at infancy with a baby in a crawling position, then a small child, Next to that is a slightly larger child, but this child has a arm in a cast. The older child with her hair and pigtails, and next to that an older uh, person with their foot in a cast. A pregnant woman, a female pushing a baby stroller, an adult female holding a briefcase, an older person bent over slightly using a cane, another person holding a walker, and finally, the last image is a person actively using a wheelchair. And the question is, who are we designing for? As David was talking about this idea, we are all future people with disabilities if we are not presently people with disabilities. We're an illness, an accident, or aging away from becoming a part of this population. We all have temporary disabilities, whether that's being hung over on a Friday morning for an 8 a.m. class or being on cold medication 
or having sun in their eyes. It doesn't have to just be a medical definition. We all have temporary disabilities. You're in France, you don't read French. How do you manage with the signage there? So it's this idea of thinking about a person as a person who goes through a journey in life. And unfortunately, our building code is designed for a six foot tall person with perfect vision, perfect hearing, and generally perfect mobility. Now there is section 3.8 that has some accommodations, but as David said, they are a minimum, and everybody knows there's a significant gap between what these, even in your lifetime, are going to need. So think about it as future-proofing. Human diversity. Story, Muller, and Mace suggest that human abilities can be grouped into seven categories. Number one, cognition. Number two, vision. Number three, hearing and speech. Number four, body function. Number five, arm function. Number six, hand function. And lastly, number seven, mobility. Human diversity has seven different categories. I'm leaving this presentation here for you. These are things that I want to put on your radar as things to be keeping in mind as you're problem solving. The great part about architecture is you're problem solving all the time. How do you problem solve so that this is inclusive and thinks about all the different functions a person might have? What is the barrier? On this slide, we see an exterior, what appears to be some kind of courtyard. The surface of this courtyard area is all large flag stones, honeyo pavers. They are irregularly shaped and irregularly spaced. The gaps between the pavers have what appears to be a form of gravel. There is no symmetry to the layout. The paths wind in and around plantings, rocks, and what appears to be an attempt to use the rocks and other logs on the site for natural seating. Wanted to share, as David said, some really good concrete examples. Here's a popular example of an exterior treatment for a site. And what do we see is the problem here? Well, right away, I'm looking at that paving and I'm thinking that is gonna start to sink and shift. Those gaps are gonna become problematic. The width of those pathways is too small. None of that seating considers the fact many people need to have back support or armrests, and certainly there's very little space that integrates a person using an assistive device to sit integrated into the seating environment there. Don't do that. What's the barrier? The picture shows two curb cuts. The curb cut at the bottom is closest to us. The curb cut at the top of the image in the center is furthest away from us, and these are connected by a crosswalk. Here we have a curb ramp on a crosswalk. Now whether you have curb ramps going through your parking lots or whether you actually have them at intersections, it doesn't really matter. Now we see some really great things in this example here. They actually provide curb cuts, which you'll see in the video, it doesn't always happen. They have detectable warning surfaces at the edge to highlight that you are leaving the safe pedestrian zone and going into where cars might be. A painted crosswalk, fantastic. But what did they not do? How aligned is this curb ramp with the direction of travel? People with disabilities using this, somebody like David who can't see, is gonna wander out into traffic because this is not aligning them with the safe destination on the other side. Equally, somebody who's not using the curb ramp, who's just using the sidewalk and trying to go past the sidewalk has no level area, so they're tipping on that angle. And for many people who are using assistive devices, that can be a tipping hazard. So obviously, don't do that. What's the barrier? This picture shows a parking lot. There are several parking spaces on the left and on the right. Bottom left of the picture, we see two accessible parking spaces, both that have pavement markings and that share a striped access aisle. Here we have parking. We've got great accessible parking, and that's fantastic. The signage may or may not be there. It's a little hard to see in the picture. Maybe they're still during construction. Maybe it's coming. But what do we not see here? We don't see a sidewalk at the top edge of the parking spaces. So they can't use the access aisle to go up to a sidewalk and then access the building from a sidewalk. They have to travel along the roadway. And particularly if you're using a seated assistive device, you're down lower. It's harder for cars to see you. This is a safety issue. And isn't the building code supposed to be at life and safety? Don't do that. What's the barrier? 
In this picture, we see an office place with a kitchen. This kitchen has all of the kitchen cabinets and counter on the left side of the picture, all done in white. And we have seating with black tables and red chairs along the right wall. The microwave is placed in the upper cabinets. Here we have an office place, but our building code does not require the kitchens and our office spaces to be accessible. A huge oversight. What problems do we see here? Well, we have a sink that isn't low enough, any, no counter space that's low enough. There's no knee space to access the sink. And where's that microwave? It's too high. You can't even access it from a seated position. The tables here, they're using pedestal tables, and the pedestal tables block the access for the toe space. Lots of color contrast problems. I'll talk about those quickly later on. What's the barrier? Here we see a large two-floor space in an office. This is meant to be a community gathering spot. There are several different seating options available in the picture. To the left of the picture, we see in the back wall a bunch of shelving, a table with some traditional chairs. In front of that, we see a carpeted area that has several different types of softer seating arrangements, including couches and coffee tables. The front right of the picture, we see, again, more traditional meeting tables. And at the back right, we see a set of staircases with hangout seats. And this is my worst. This is the thing everybody's all celebrating. You're seeing all this all over the internet and things like this, where they're creating these collaborative workspaces that are meant to echo the environment that people have at colleges. That's great, except that this staircase doesn't have handrails on both sides. So for people who need to have the stability, they can't access that. They have hangout steps. You might as well hang an able-bodied only sign here because you're not going to be able to access or sit with your friends. If you can imagine a sign at a university that says, students who are female may not socialize here, students of a particular racialized community may not socialize here, you'd say, that's appalling. Anyone who builds hangout steps is hanging out a sign saying, people with disabilities, go socialize somewhere else. And if you can see, the storage space here is too high. You can't access those upper shelves. There's often uh, tables in the way. Lots of things here. I could actually talk a full half hour just on this one picture. But this is the type of problem that the design community just doesn't see. What's the barrier? There are two pictures on this slide. The picture on the left indicates how one could arrange and what elements would be required for an area of refuge placed inside an exit stair. Elements required include a directional signage, that indicates where the area of refuge is with an illuminated sign and with tactile signage. It also includes a call box with instructions, also are provided in braille and large color contrasted text. And then there is a lobby fire command center base station where the people who are waiting in areas of refuge are identified by a light for the firefighters to find. The image on the right is indicating an area of refuge in an elevator lobby. All of the same elements are indicated for the location, the identification, the instruction, the call box, and the smart rescue base station. This is a huge one. In the building code, we don't require equity in life safety. What do I mean by that? I mean, when the fire alarm is pulled, you are not allowed to take the elevator, yes? Okay, so they say that you don't have to provide a safe fire separated smoke protected area for people with disabilities if you have sprinklers. So in today's world, we commonly have sprinklers in buildings. That's terrific, except that, wait a minute, water on fire creates what? Smoke. What kills people? Smoke. Can you imagine how terrifying it would be if you yourself couldn't leave a building during a fire? Where would you wait safely? Or worse, perhaps for you right now as an able-bodied person, what if your loved one was a person with a disability? Your parent, your grandparent, the fire alarm gets pulled off. Where do they go to wait safely for rescue? So these are some really good examples of what actual inclusive fire safety looks like. Design for vision loss. This slide has four different images on them labeled A, B, C, and D. In the top left corner, we see photo A. The top right, we see photo B. Bottom left, we see photo C. And the bottom right, we see photo D. 
And then very quickly, especially because David's here, I wanted to talk about some things that are not covered. If you were going to go beyond code, trying to reach what you're actually required by law to do, then you're going to be thinking about the example here, A, which is a tactile map, typically not seen. It's got raised elements, braille. In example B, directional wayfinding from the bus stop right to the hospital entrance. Those are the elongated bars. You can find that in some of the resources I'm going to give you. Example C is talking about effective color contrast. I often hear architects and interior designers, because they're not taught this and the importance of this, particularly for people with vision loss or people who are confused, color contrast is huge for wayfinding. So they come up with a design aesthetic and then they have to try to fix it and they feel like it's been ruined. Program for inclusion. A small medical office layout that includes two washrooms, a reception area, an office area for staff that includes four desks, and the MD's office above the reception beside the office area. The bigger issue is that accessibility is both a macro exercise and a micro exercise. So this is an example of the macro. You've got to get your architectural programming right to include people with disabilities. If your architectural programming has been sitting on a shelf for many years without review and without update to include the spatial impact of path of travel, clearance at doors, turn spaces, so that both the staff and the visitors could be people with disabilities, then your space requirements or the square footage you've allowed will simply not accommodate the current code requirements or beyond code. Very lastly here, Harvard is offering now a free web-based course for everybody and offering to teach people the fundamental principles of architecture. So my challenge to you, to encourage you to go forward from today, remember that people with disabilities are to be designed for as people first and not as an afterthought. What is accessible design? There are four pictures here. Each has a title. The top left picture says exclusion. A large gray circle with blue figures representing both male and female, the able-bodied, and outside of the box we have gray figures representing people with disabilities, both visible and invisible. The second image at the top right says segregation. Two circles that are separate and distinct from each other Again, the large circle shows blue figures representing both men and women, the able-bodied, and the smaller gray circle on the right has the gray figures representing people with disabilities, both visible and invisible. The bottom left has a title of integration. The two circles are overlapping each other. The small circle is inside the larger circle, but the blue figures representing the able-bodied are separate and distinct from the people with disabilities in the smaller gray circle. The bottom right hand side has a title of inclusion, a large gray circle with the blue figures we saw before for the able-bodied mixed up with the gray figures for the people with disabilities all together in the same place. David was talking about the segregation that we've moved from to inclusion and I have provided resources that I will leave here for you. Beyond Code Resources. Resource number one, CSA B651-12, Accessible Design for the Built Environment. Resource two, City of London FADS, F-A-D-S. Resource number three, City of Mississauga FADS. Resource number four, City of Toronto ADG. Resource number five, City of Ottawa, ADS. Resource number six, Brock University FADS. Resource number seven, Best Practices from Illustrated Guide to the AODA Design of Public Spaces. The resource link is g-a-a-t-e-s dot o-r-g forward slash resources dash build dash environment. Okay, hey, a couple of things about what you can do. The first is, to the extent that architects and other design professionals look both at designing uh, buildings and spaces to be usable or functional and to be aesthetically pleasing, I encourage you to consider that the priority must be a clear one. Full accessibility first. 
We don't compromise accessibility to make it pretty. We don't make it pretty and then go, oh, but what are we going to do about that accessibility stuff? We design a fully accessible space, period. And then we can talk about the aesthetics. And anyone who gets those priorities backward is, respectfully, getting it wrong. So what do you do about it? I'm going to give you a couple ideas. The first is, as Thea said, learn about it. Second, encourage, demand that your professors teach you about it. Third, commit from this day onward, you are going to design in accordance with principles of universal design because that's what you came to a design profession to be, a person who designs for everyone. Someone who doesn't want to find out later, oh my gosh, I didn't mean to do it, but look what I've done by accident. I've left people out. Number four, if you want to learn about this, aside from signing up for our updates, I encourage you to go on to Twitter. You can follow us if you like at AODA Alliance, but even if not, we've created a new hashtag. We're inviting people to go out and photograph barriers and describe them in the words of their tweets so we blind folks can follow them too, to share them on Twitter and to enable us to tweet them to politicians and journalists. This Twitter campaign is rallied around a hashtag that we invented. It's AODA fail. So if you search on the number sign and then AODA fail, you will be stunned by what people have found. But not just looking at it, I encourage you as part of your learning exercise to do your own AODA fail scavenger hunt. We also commend AODA wins when people get it right. I want to show you a video that the AODA Alliance produced in late November where we went to one brand new public building. Remember that expectation people have? New buildings, they're going to be great. Old buildings, they're the problem. The AODA Alliance produced an 18-minute video. It's up on YouTube, but we're going to show you the six-minute shorter version. And as you watch this, I encourage you to ask yourself, do I ever want to design a building that ends up in a video like this? While we're sorting this out, I wanted to give you one other bit of information that you may want to think about. When people talk about accessibility and the built environment, it's typical for people to think about people in wheelchairs or with mobility issues. And that's, of course, important. But I want you to think much more broadly. It affects people who don't have any mobility device at all but may have trouble walking long distances. It includes people with vision loss who need to avoid head level barriers, who need clear color contrast, and who need wayfinding markings through wide open spaces like great open foyers. I want you to think about people with other disabilities. If it's somebody with autism spectrum disorder, they may have sensory integration issues so that the kind of noise in the background can affect their ability to be comfortable in the environment. You ready to go? Okay, I think we're ready. All right, let her rip. My name is David Lepofsky. Today is uh, Saturday, November the 19th, 2016, and I'm standing in the basement of the brand new uh, Culinary Arts Center built uh, with our tax dollars at Centennial College in the northeast corner of Toronto. I've come to look around to see how well they did on accessibility. Parking pay machine. Near the accessible parking spots, there is a parking meter for you to pay for your parking. However, it's at standing height, so that's not accessible to somebody in a wheelchair who uses the accessible parking spots. That makes no sense. Exterior ramp. There is a ramp beside the stairs going to the front door, and that's good. But there's only a railing on one side, not both sides. There should be, for accessibility, a railing on both sides. Some people uh, need one on both sides or may need one on the side which is missing for balance. Moreover, the side where there is no rail is the side where there's a vertical drop-off that presents a safety problem, not only for people with disabilities, but frankly for everybody, especially little kids. Washrooms. I'm, I'm now on the basement floor of the Culinary Arts Building, the brand new building at, uh, at Centennial College uh, in Scarborough. And uh, here they have a public women's washroom. And right next to the men's washroom, the only thing between them is a, uh, uh, a little thin uh, uh, wall or something. So here's the thing. Beside the women's washroom, it's great that they've got signage with raised letters and it says women in Braille. But 
um, a blind person isn't going to be feeling the entire wall to find out uh, whether there's a sign here. And when we walk by, what we would hear is just the echo. Uh, and it doesn't sound like there's two separate bathrooms. It sounds like there would be just one. So I wouldn't know to go over and check further that beyond here is the men's room uh, if I was here for the first time and then look for a sign here. Uh, it would be way better if they simply had a door with a sign. Elevator. This says main, but the voice on the elevator is going to say ground, which is referring to a floor that's not the ground floor, it's one above the ground floor. I'm just pushing the main button. In Braille, it says main. Listen to the elevator. Ground voice. floor. Which would be completely confusing to me. Well, am I the ground floor or am I the main floor? Barrier-free washroom. Right outside the elevators I just came up uh, is an inclusive washroom. And there's a Braille sign here that says inclusive washroom, which is great. And there's the international accessibility symbol. Um, but the automatic door opener is not where you would figure it would be right here. You'd have to know to start feeling all over until you get over here uh, to find it. Um, and then we have, the big problem though is when I open the door, there's no transfer space in the bathroom. It's a bathroom meant for people with disabilities to be accommodated, but there's no not the needed transfer space uh, to meet their needs. South Vestibule. Now, once you're open that one door and you're now between the inside door and the outside door, again, here we've got another one of these valves, one of these things sticking up from the floor that I've uh, not encountered in virtually any other building except the disastrous design of the Women's College Hospital. Um, wouldn't even know to look for it, but if I look for it, I'd be confused by the fact that for some other doors, uh, these automatic door openers on the wall, not on something sticking up in the middle, but let's get past that problem. I then come over here and feel there's a button. I don't necessarily know there are two buttons. So I'm looking to go out the door, and I only find this one to push it. And I push this one to figure out which it is. And while I'm standing here, this door comes over and hits me. East crosswalk number one. And they have a crosswalk right here with no curb cuts and no tactile uh, prompting that there's a crosswalk here. Now there is a crosswalk with curb cuts just a few meters away, but when I uh, show you how it's designed, you'd realize it's not much of a solution. East crosswalk number two. So here, just a few feet away, is this other crosswalk where they did put in a curb cut, uh, but it points me, as a blind person, to walking into oncoming traffic, rather than if they had made the other inaccessible uh, crosswalk accessible, it would point me to go right across the way you ordinarily would cross a street. So this is just, from the point of view of safety and accessibility, um, another blunder. Conclusion. Thanks for watching this video. To learn more about us, visit our website at www.aodaalliance.org. To follow our tweets, follow us at, at AODA Alliance on Twitter. And if you want to sign up to get our email updates, just send an email to aodafeedback at gmail.com. And all you have to say is, sign me up. We welcome your feedback. Let us know about AODA fails or AODA wins that you know about around Ontario. If you want to see the long version of this video with more examples of problems with accessibility, go to YouTube and do a search on AODA Alliance and Centennial College and long version. Okay, we've only got a couple of minutes left before you've got to get on to other classes, so let me wrap up with a couple of observations. That video, which is as amateurish as it could be, is just the eight, six minute version. I do encourage you to go to YouTube to search on Centennial College and AODA Alliance. Watch the 18 minute version. There are more examples, and they're comparable examples of accessibility problems. This is a brand new building at a community college. It should never have happened. But what's powerful about it is they wanted to get accessibility right. Similarly, the Osgoode Hall Law School, I believe, wanted to get accessibility right. 
The problem is a combination of design professionals who haven't been trained to do this adequately, building code and AODA standards that are inadequate, and the misconception that all you got to do to meet legal requirements is to fulfill the building code and the AODA standards. To disregard the higher requirement of full inclusion in the Charter of Rights and in the Human Rights Code is to make a fundamental mistake, a legal mistake, that can cause significant problems and consequences, both for the design professional, for the organization whose building it is, and, of course, most important, for all of us who want to be included. Now, I want to end on a really positive note. There's a lot of room for you to make a difference. You are in the fantastic point of being at the start of your career. You're still learning. Take this on as a challenge and as an exciting opportunity. Look for AODA fails and AODA wins. Let us know and tweet them. We welcome your idea if you email us about how you might be able to help get design professionals on the right side of this issue as often as we can. And most important of all, make that commitment today that whatever you design is going to be designed for everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity for us to speak to you today.